my name is Jeff Jackson. I'm going to be hosting the event for you. Uh, what we're doing tonight, we're going to be telling you some stories based on the paintings in this fine gallery. And uh, I could not have been more thrilled when they asked me to do this assignment. It was tremendous. I've done a lot of, a lot of performance in my time, and this has got to be one of the more handsome environments uh, in which I've been fortunate enough to do this for you. So we came together. Uh, Jen Cleary is the, the producer of this event, top-notch human being. She said, would you be interested in doing this? I said, of course I would. We came into the gallery, and immediately I was struck by one painting. Even before I came into the room, I think I heard it. I felt the vibration of it through the wall, and it's just over here. Uh, by Winslow Homer, Temperance Meeting. And I looked at it, and I was like, wow, that is, that's top notch. And then I read the description next to it, which was so powerful and so moving for me that I have uh, gone to the bother of writing it out for you, because it uh, bears repeating. And I've gone to the bother of wearing several pockets. So, temperance meeting. We have these uh, two young people in a delightful agrarian environment. And then beside the painting, the following description. Temperance meeting cleverly refers to the rising American temperance movement, a crusade against drinking alcohol, by depicting a stout milkmaid pausing while a farm hand drinks from her ladle. Saucy stuff. Swaying under the weight of her pail and squinting into the sun, she presents the ideal of natural womanhood. Her powerful presence, muscular arms, and sunburned skin counters the farmhand's relaxed stance and shaded face, saucier still. Visually reversing traditional gender roles, far from flirting, the two figures awkwardly avoid each other's gaze, modeling rural wholesomeness and recititude. Good gracious, right? Wow. Whew, it's hot in the gallery, right? There's some heat, there's some heat in here. Um, but that's, I, mean, I loved it when I saw it, and then I read that, and it struck me so powerfully, uh, and took me to a place and a time that I'm gonna tell you about in, in the next few minutes, and then we're gonna bring up some of these incredibly talented performers, and we're gonna have a wonderful time together. So I didn't always look and dress like this. I didn't always look like, oh, is that, is that Lenny Kravitz if, if he'd been cast as the Defense Against the Dark Arts uh, professor <laughs> at Hogwarts? I didn't always look like this. Uh, there was a time where I looked much more, I mean, at least my outfit looked much more like the gentleman on the right there, uh, dungarees covered in earth that I'd been tilling with my own hands and shovels and wide-brimmed hats and uh, ill-fitting flannel shirts. There, there was a time, I was about 22 years old, uh, and by that point, I'd already, in uh, typical fashion, I'd, I tried to do performance first-person narrative, music, comedy, poetry. For six years by that point, I used to have to sneak into bars to do their open mic to try to tell jokes. There was a place, uh, this is out west in Arizona where the story takes place, there's a place called Charlie's. It's a restaurant by day, and then they have a bar at night and an open mic, which if you've never been, you don't have to go. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to go. Uh, but. It's a bar at night, so you have to be 21. So from 16, I realized that if I got there at five in the afternoon, I could just sit there with a cup of coffee, infuriating the staff, of course. Uh, but they wouldn't start carding. They wouldn't start asking for identification until about 8.30, and then the list would go out at nine, and then the open mic would start at 10, and then I'd go some on, on sometime about 1.30 in the morning. So I'd put in a good eight hours to tell three minutes of funny haiku. At least I thought it was funny. So I did this for about four years and decided five years and then six years. And I said, you know what? Show business isn't working. This one attempt, clearly misguided at show business, wasn't working. I'm going to quit. I'm going to move to the country. I'm going to be a gentleman farmer in the style of Thomas Jefferson, but with some noticeable differences about the organization of labor. So I moved to the country and I got married. I was deeply in love with a wonderful woman who reminds me very much of the woman on the left here with the pail, perhaps contributing to the sauciness of the libretto beside the painting. And we were pretty good at it. We grew everything. 
We grew several types of tomatoes. We grew several types of melons. We grew gourds, which were decorative, inedible things. I had hundreds of them all over the place. Didn't know what to do with them. I grew amaranth and sorghum and several types of basil. I grew uh, multiple types of beans, uh, sunflowers that were like 11 feet tall. Sesame? I grew sesame. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to be a farmer. This is my future. Now, there was no plan to sell the vegetables, just to grow the vegetables. <laughs> So I'm living in this place, the name of it, Cornville, C-O-R-N-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Evidently, it was a, a confusion at the post office a century before where someone had an accent and was supposed to be Cohenville, but it was called Cornville. Someone told me that when I moved there, when they were trying to be my friend, I didn't get the rest of the story because I wasn't there to make friends. I was there to grow vegetables. And I did, did for a couple of seasons. Oh, it was wonderful. I gave up uh, all vices, stopped drinking. Prior to that, I drank a great deal. I was like, I'm not going to drink anymore. Again, the temperance meeting. And this went, this went okay for a couple of years. And then one morning, I went out and I was tending my, uh, my brassica, uh, leafy vegetables. Uh, brassica includes everything from cabbage and lettuce uh, all the way out to Brussels sprouts, which are actually very closely related, though they don't look at or taste it. And I was out tending my brassica, and I saw a grasshopper. And I thought, hmm. Did I feel a shadow pass over my heart? No, it's probably just, I've just been out here too long. And then I went inside and I came out later that day and there were more grasshoppers. And then the next day there were more grasshoppers. And then the day after that there were grasshoppers on everything. Everything. A, like a plague of locusts, you know, from the books, from the past, from the scary movies. These grasshoppers came and they covered it, they ate everything. They ate all of my vegetables. They ate all of my brassica. They ate all of my sorghum, which was about 12 feet tall. There's a lot of sorghum to eat. I didn't eat it, certainly, because it's, it's, not, it's not really edible. Um, they ate everything. They ate my vegetables. They ate, it turns out, also uh, my lifestyle. They ate uh, my marriage, for sure. They ate my 2000 Chevy Cavalier. They ate my carefully constructed attempt to escape from who I really am, which is, as we mentioned at the top, uh, Lenny Kravitz as a Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. <laughs> and I found myself uh, bereft of everything and uh, identifying with another painting, which is directly behind all of you, also by Winslow Homer, Winter Coast. We had a moment to look at it on the way in and check it out on the way out. It is one man alone in an inhospitable, cold, lifeless environment staring into the void. And after a couple of years of staring into the void, I moved to Philadelphia and started to get my act together. Met Jane Clary and company, and they very kindly asked me to be here. And now here, all of us are together. So, <sighs> farming. Don't don't take it. Don't don't do it casually. It's for serious people. Is what I'm trying to say. That's the takeaway. That's the takeaway.